The former Nigerian finance minister, Ngozi Okonjo Urala, will make history later today as she will become the first African, as well as the first female, to lead the World Trade Organization. Dr. Okonjo Urala will be taking the helm during one of the toughest times for global trade as international markets have been decimated by the coronavirus pandemic. However, Dr. Okonjo Urala has significant goals she wishes to achieve during her tenure. Her agenda includes reversing the impact of the pandemic, tackling climate change, and restoring trust back into the trading system, which some critics have said has, has been out of touch for a number of years. Well, Dr. Okonjo Wiala has told reporters she believes the World Health Organization can change the world for the better. However, it needs to do better in reflecting the world we live in today. I believe that was the World Trade Organization. Now, for more on Ngozi Okonjiwala and her confirmation today, former Finance Minister Kalu Idikakalu, who was designated as Nigeria's candidate for the Deputy DG position at the World Trade Organization in 1999, joins us now to discuss the prospects and economic importance of today's history making event. You're welcome, Doctor. It's good to have you on uh, Newsday. Thank you. Okay, now I know that. Thank you uh, very much. Yeah, the, the pleasure is ours. I know that your paths, the, the, your paths and the path of Ngozi Okonjiwala have crossed many times in the past. Tell us in your opinion, if your view is that she's the right woman at the right time for the right job. Well, I think um, there's no question that uh, she's had a very, very career and this has come at the right time. Uh, after all the experience she's garnered, uh, I first met Ngozi when she was a student at Harvard, and then, of course, I was at the World Bank myself. And uh, each time I went back to Washington after I had left the World Bank before she came, uh, we interacted. And, of course, I came back here. Two of us have been in finance twice. So <laughs> there are so many similarities. So you can see that uh, from my personal knowledge of her and the family, the, the whole works are training and background, uh, I'm probably in a position to say exactly where this fits in. Uh, Ngozi is uh, very inclined to policy making. She's very active, in fact, almost to the point where some of us kid her. She's quite a politician. So these are some of the things that you need now to get um, a world trade situation that is in, to some extent in Tatars because of the politics, because of the pandemic, uh, the emphasis on regional blocks uh, and the sort of spread to bilateral negotiations as distinct from multilateral negotiations. So it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how she brings her energy and her experience to bear on this new assignment that she'll be stepping into. All right, Doctor. Uh, in this uh, modern age of inclusiveness or inclusivity, if you like, First African, first female, to be at the head of WTO. Would you like to speak to that? Well, uh, we don't want to discriminate, even in favor of the women. I, 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 I don't think we should overemphasize that. But it is a remarkable achievement in its own right. But I think in this day and age where... Uh, we are still behind. I'm talking about first in terms of Africa now. We are still quite behind. As you know, uh, we, our, trading, our trading amongst ourselves is about a third of what it is, say, among the Europeans, less than 20%, whereas the Europeans, about 70%. So that's a big task, particularly when you relate it to the new organization that has recently been set up. As a woman, I think we all agree that uh, men have, uh, have been in the thing for too long, both at the national level and the international level. So we want to show that women can do just as well as men. So I think for us to have uh, somebody of the caliber of Ngozi to emphasize that fact that uh, women should be moving to these positions without anybody batting an eyelid. Um, so that is the other score. And she's qualified. She's uh, well-trained. She's had national experience. She's had, obviously, international experience and also experience in other organizations. So on all those three scores, uh, Ngozi fits the bill. 
So it's very significant that, um, and I can see that she's very enthusiastic about the job. That's also very important. You see, it's not just the position. The person who is taking it up as the first woman, the first African, and so on and so forth, also has to exhibit those uh, personal uh, aptitude that will enhance the fact that this is a first in so many uh, scores. Indeed, I totally agree with you that it's taking more than her gender or race. It's more of her pedigree, her wealth of experience that she's, she's bringing to the job. Exactly. But beyond breaking the jinx right. of being the first woman, the first African, what's the need for Africa, really? Uh, especially at a time where we have the AFCFTA in place, like you have mentioned. What does Africa stand to benefit from a Dr. Konjo Wiala at the helm of affairs? Well, you know, in these things, uh, no matter her position is administrative, the real decisions are usually taken at the ministerial conference level. But as we all know, whether you're African or European or what have you, to have your own person at the key position where things are organized, where the agenda is uh, decided, where the contacts can uh, take focus, it should give Africa an additional chance to be a major player. Right now, we haven't been. But I must emphasize the fact that the issue doesn't start from trade negotiation. The issue goes back to the efficiency of decision making in various countries, in the various regions, the efficiency of production, the efficiency of transportation, packaging, and what have you. So we should, we should see that sequence. So it's not just a matter of uh, we have a person at the, at the head of the administration of WTO. We have to now make sure that our internal policies at those levels I've mentioned, within the region, within the various countries, uh, a lot of those decisions that are now carried on at the bilateral level, for them to now have more significance with uh, Dr. Konjo Iwala at the, at the helm of the WTO's administration. Uh, we, we also are now being given no excuse to not do better than we have done in the past. You look back at the European uh, Union, you look back at uh, the AGOA, which the Americans uh, gave Africans a chance to, to grow and export into their markets. But the, the shortfall in some of our ability to exercise these opportunities goes right back to uh, local conditions. For instance, in Nigeria, uh, we know that in order to make the most of this, we have to sort out the issue of uh, rampant insecurity. I was just listening to your news talking about uh, insecurity all over the place. If you don't have security, people cannot invest. If people don't invest, they don't produce. So no matter what WTO is doing, uh, you find that you are not really able to deliver the substance for the negotiations to sell more to Latin America, to sell more to Europe, to sell more to Chiane, and so on and so forth. So we must see the sequence. Policies are the starting point. Negotiations now help you to push your products, both your traditional products and whatever new products into the arena on the best terms that you can negotiate. So that is really the sequence. Okay, well, thank you for that. But I still want us to fix our lens on the WTO. Uh, you were designated as Nigeria's candidate for the deputy yes, yes. DG position. So can you give us an idea of what it was that led it to be so out of touch that we're now looking at trying to restore trust in the institution? And what it is that Ngozi can do, Ngozi Okonjiwala, that is, to restore that trust. Uh, she's admitted that she's not a trade expert, but that she brings a clear set of eyes to, to, the, to the mix. Can you help us with that? Yes, well, the trust has dissipated over time because of the parochialism of the major players, if you like. And one shouldn't be biased here. We will blame China, we will blame America, we will blame the European Union, we will blame the, the Latin Americans. You see, naturally, as you can see from my own standpoint, it is the local nationalism, the parochialism that arises from local nationalism, where you want to push your own interest. Whereas we all understand right from the time the GATT got, now was transformed into the WTO, the essence of it is that the freer 
the larger the trading between nations, because this springs from the whole idea of dynamic division of labor, whereby uh, consumers' welfare in all member countries can be enhanced, where they are able to access goods from everywhere, everywhere. And those goods are produced in the most cost-effective cost way in those countries. So it, it takes the whole old Adam Smith uh, theory of division of labor, that is, products are produced by those who can do it the best. But you know, when you begin to bring in a lot of local politics, of course the trust begins to erode. So that is what has eroded the, the trust. And I think uh, Ngozi's strength arises from the fact that she can see, if you like, through the whole connective uh, uh, chain from efficiency in production, which also means efficiency in investment, efficiency in financing, where developing countries can be assisted once you can identify their own dynamic comparative advantage. So people can pull back and make sure that they are assisted to produce those goods which they are naturally more fitted to because of their skills, because of the raw materials and so on and so forth. So these are the skills you will need to bring in to restore that uh, you know, position of the WTO as a reliable source of advice to many countries that want, uh, you know, their trade ministers come to these meetings, they are, take advice on what's happening in various parts of the world. So I think that is how that trust in WTO can be restored. And I think she has the skills, she has the negotiating skills. And of course, as she has told us, she's got the eye to make sure that uh, WTO now ascends back to its uh, primary position, which God played for a while. But you know, God was set up on that very uh, post-war, you know, uh, lack of trust and uh, hedginess in negotiations. But we have come away from that, although, of course, people are worrying that some of the new tensions between, say, the U.S. and China, between the U.S. and, um, and Russia, and uh, some of the other countries in the Middle East and so on and so forth. So that she will have her work really cut out for her to restore that primacy of trust in WTO, WTO as an uh, impartial arbiter in trade negotiations and in proffering advice as to how to restore uh, efficiency in trade flows between various parts of the world. All right, uh, Dork, uh, we're going to keep you on pause, but before I do that, still on that angle, you know, how should or what should be Ngozi Okonjo-Iweala's first task? That of trust, reversing the effects of the pandemic or the climate change. When we come back from this break, you'll tackle that question. You're still watching news, we'll be back in a bit. Don't go away. I'm glad to have you back on news day later today. Ngozi Okunji well, I would take uh, the position as a DG of the World Trade Organization. And we're discussing with uh, former finance minister, Dr. Carlo Idika Carlo. Uh, glad to still have you there. Yeah, like, just to remind you, in case you've forgotten the question, uh, what should be her first task? I mean, we'll have, you know, that our priority, we'll have scale of preference. What should be Ngozi's first task? That of reversing the effects of the pandemic, trust, and then the issue of climate change. Doctor. Well, I even thought you mentioned a third factor. Well, um, you know, the urgent questions of the day don't have to wait for you to, to have your priorities. All these issues are all interconnected. Let me start by saying that uh, from my own professional standpoint, uh, She's quite lucky to be coming on board with the new administration in America that is now beginning to show more positive interest in the real essence of uh, uh, nations observing the imperatives of climatic change. Uh, also, you have a new administration in Washington that uh, has, has come out very forthrightly to see the, 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 the shared dimensions of the pan pandemic right now with the new strains coming up 
South Africa, UK, America, and it's spreading to other countries. Um, all those issues are very dynamic and are changing very, very rapidly. As I said, her position is really administrative head of the structure. She is, uh, she is going to have to uh, find a way to put these issues on the front burner for members by the way she interacts with their leaders, with their uh, trade ministers and so on. That is the way she will do it. She, she cannot really independently take decisions on climate change or on the pandemic. I hope you understand what I'm saying. But she, she, uh, this is a central data pool for all countries, things that will impinge on movements, on transportation, on shipping, and so on and so forth. So this is where uh, she has the advantage of passing along to members in advising them on the experience that she's getting from other countries' uh, uh, preferences of how to deal with these two issues. So that is really the issue. There will be no question of uh, starting first with pandemic or starting first with uh, climate change. Those two are working together. And with the new administration, as we know, whatever you might say, uh, America has been in the forefront of pushing uh, the setup of some of these organizations. Certainly, with their resource base, they are able to lead in the fight against the coronavirus. And I think that um, these are issues, as I said, that put her in very good stead. Of course, she'd be based in Geneva, but she'd be uh, traveling quite uh, frequently to all the major capitals to liaise with uh, all those that actually take the decisions. So that those decisions will be taken in a way that will be of optimal uh, uh, help to all the member countries and not just something that is going to be based solely on American interests or, or the, uh, uh, the Americas as a whole or European interests, but also will take the interests of Africa and Latin America and Asian countries into, into account. All right, so me, this, this will be the you. test. Let me just she has up. to be on top of... Yeah, let me follow up on this issue. Uh, right. Rick, I was going to ask you this. You've mentioned this, so let me right. just follow up on it. Let, let's deal with that one. How should she respond to the behemoth? That's what I mm -hmm. call them. I'll call them now uh, America. Uh, even with uh, Trump hasn't quit, the, of course, he's quit the scene, uh, not by choice, but he had to be uh, uh, selected out, as it were. And then Biden's administration supporting her. How should she deal with America? Well, I think uh, if you look, like my, my saying so, a lot of the fire and thunder we are seeing in the immediate post-election in uh, America. She will die down because everybody can see. Uh, I'm not going to go into details of uh, all the points in disputation. So I think that she should just stand on the premise that um, uh, a, new, a new man has been elected. He certainly carried the vote by a substantial margin, uh, seven or eight million. Uh, it comes after uh, a leader that was uh, seen to be really not taking both climatic, climatic uh, change as well as uh, multilateralism, uh, you know, the whole notion of America first, uh, really at the sub in the substance of it, ran counter to what, say, the WTO stands for. The WTO stands for the welfare of the entire world community. Of course, uh, that's a slogan. Each country, whether it's Nigeria or America, has to also take their own national interest first. But you don't go mouthing that as if uh, you can do that at the expense. And of course, this affected the way they looked at trade. Uh, professionally, I know that uh, America first doesn't mean that you have to run a, a trade surplus with every country. That might, in fact, affect your own country because you end up paying higher prices for your imports when you are trying to uh, avoid the, the imperatives of uh, dynamics of uh, efficiency from the most uh, cost-effective uh, producers. So there was something substantially wrong with that concept, where it didn't take into account the efficiency that world trade, that international trade, that multilateral negotiations bring to reducing costs for everybody. So 
Ngozi will be on very safe territory, follow on those professional angles to deal with America. Okay. I don't think she needs to get involved with the uh, domestic American pol uh, politics and so on. She does, uh, there will be no cause for that, even though, of course, you know, we, she trained in America, she's okay. worked at the World Bank <coughs> in America, like the rest of us did. But Let me the just question ask is quite clear. Okay. Mm. Uh, her candidacy received endorsement right. from the U.S., China, the EU, and we all know it's about geopolitics. Mm. Um, but how much of all of these issues that the WHO, uh, WTO, beg your pardon, is facing at the moment would need to perhaps be settled on the bilateral level to have an impact on the WTO and Dr. Ngozi okonjo Wala's tenure? Uh, in your own opinion, should we be looking at some of these issues on bilateral uh, levels, even though the goal of the WTO is for multilateralism and not the protection of protectionist tendencies we are seeing growing at the moment? Well, as I said, at this level, very few, very few issues can be compartmentalized. She has to be looking at the bilateral interests of the major countries. In fact, her skills will be trying to isolate those bilateral concerns. We should, she should know that. She should have at her fingertips the bilateral position of every member country, particularly the major players. But her position will be in the diplomacy of sublimating some of these uh, centrifugal forces that should be pulling from bilateral interest into the multilateralism that will bring the World Trade Organization back into play as a major clearing board. So there's no question of in interjecting any uh, the interest of America or the interest of Russia or China, but she has to be in a very diplomatic way to be very sensitive to those interests. In fact, uh, they, they give advice on the negotiations by intruding some of these bilateral concerns, but it has to be now cleared at the, multilateral, at the multilateral level. So you do not have to uh, uh, play on one at the expense of the other. WTO is a multilateral organization, but it also sublimates the bilateral interests, particularly of the major players. Of course, like we've just formed the new Africa Trade uh, Union, she has to be sensitive to what Africa requires, even though we are uh, from the industrial trade uh, production standpoint, and maybe even negotiation skills and the rest of it, we will be trying to catch up with more of some of the more advanced countries. And uh, right. Ngozi being from Africa, being from a major right, player in Nigeria, she yeah. has to be sensitive to that. Good. Mm. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much for being on Newsday, Dr. Etika Carlos.